This is Sunshine for the Soul with Michael Kaiser from Sylacauga Church of Christ. Hello, my name is Michael Kaiser. I'm minister for the Sylacauga Church of Christ. It's our pleasure to welcome you to another program of Sunshine for the Soul. This day we want to read a passage of scripture from Luke chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. This is a story regarding the man named Zacchaeus and Jesus meeting with that man. In Luke chapter 19, verses 1 through 10, we read, And Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was the chief among the publicans, and he was rich. And he sought to see Jesus, who he was, and could not for the press, that is, the crowd, because he was of little stature. And he ran before and climbed up into a sycamore tree, to see him, for he was to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. And he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they were all murmuring, saying that he was gone to be a guest with a man that was a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. If I've taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house, for as much as he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Now we're emphasizing what we find in verse 10. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Now for a few moments today, we're going to think about the topic, the lost. The lost. The very words that used by Jesus, he came to seek and to save that which was lost. Now as you and I will look at the story concerning Zacchaeus, we know that he was known in the city of Jericho as being a sinner. Well, somebody may say, well, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Surely everybody in Jericho was recognized as being a sinner. Well, that's exactly right. But the people have singled out a man of Zac like Zacchaeus because of his profession, and he's regarded as being kind of the worst of all sinners that could be in town. The reason being was he was a tax collector. In other words, he was working for the Roman government, and therefore the Jewish people considered him to be a traitor to their nation. He was working for the Romans collecting those taxes. Well, that being the case, we find that uh, this man had an appeal he made to Jesus. And Jesus then gave him the matter of salvation. We focus our attention upon verse 10, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. This was the response that Jesus made to all the uncharitable statements that were made concerning him. You see, our Lord was criticized by the Pharisees and the others because he went to that man's house to eat. In other words, they thought there was guilt by association. If Jesus is going to hang up this notorious sinner then sure he himself must be a sinful man. But Jesus said, now listen, folks, I came to seek and to save that which was lost. Now, sick people don't need to go see a doctor. Only sick people, and that's sick people are the ones that need to go see a doctor. Well, people do not need to go see a doctor. Let me put that in the right frame of mind. They're the right words. Now, that's the case. And so Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. The holy said, need not a physician. Only the sick need a physician. And surely Zacchaeus was a sick man, spiritually speaking, and he needed the great doctor of souls, the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, as you and I look at this matter of the lost, there are some questions that come to our mind. One question is this. What does it mean for a person to be lost? What does it mean for a person to be lost? In biblical terminology, the word lost being used, what does it mean for a person to be lost? Well, friends, it means to be without God in this world. Now, Paul describes some folks as being without hope, without God in this world. That is, they're spiritually destitute. Now, the Lord said concerning some people in Revelation chapter 3 that they thought they were rich and increased with goods, had need of nothing. But they did not know their real spiritual condition. They were poor and blind and naked. And so some folks, my friends, think they're very well off, spiritually speaking, that everything's okay, but then ignorant of their real destitute situation. They're lost. And so just because a person thinks they're saved does not mean that they are saved. 
To be lost means to be without God in this world. It also means to be without hope in this world. Now, to be without hope in this world means if you left this world without hope, then where are you going to spend your eternity? Now, the Apostle Paul wrote to the Thessalonian people in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And he said, I want to have you ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not as others which have no hope. In other words, there are people who have reason to sorrow because they have no hope. Now, who has no hope? The person without the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, think about that rich man in Luke chapter 16. We refer to his case often, and I know you've heard me say some things about him before, but let's look again at Luke chapter 16, the rich man and Lazarus. Now, it came to pass that both of those men died. Lazarus was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man was died and lifted his eyes in hell, being in torment. Now, what did he want there in torment? He wanted some relief. He wanted some relief. He thought maybe there was the possibility that Abraham, old father Abraham, could send Lazarus, that he could dip the tip of his finger in water and cool his tongue because he was in torment. And one of the things we find that uh, Father Abraham had to say to the rich man was this. Between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed. Now, what did that mean? Well, Abraham explained it to him. Nobody leaves my bosom to come down into torment, and nobody leaves torment to come up into my bosom. In other words, your destiny now is fixed. And so if you have no hope in this life, because you're without God, without Christ, and you leave the walk of this life without hope and without Christ, my friends, there'll be no changing your condition the after a while. That's a sad thing to entertain, but a very serious matter to consider. And so it means to be without hope if you die in that condition. Now it means to come before the throne of God on the great judgment day unprepared. We think about what Amos the prophet said long ago to the people of Israel, prepare to meet thy God. Now, we've seen that sign probably on the side of the road somewhere, prepare to meet thy God. What does that mean? It means, my friends, we're all coming before the great tribunal, coming before the judgment bar of God. We're all going to appear there. Paul said we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. The wise man Solomon said, let's hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every work into judgment, every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. We're going to stand before the great white throne one day. And so to be lost, my friends, means we're going to come before the great white throne and receive an unfavorable verdict. For the Lord will say to those in the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed in everlasting fire, prepare for the devil and his angels. Now we look at the question, what does it mean to be lost? It means to be without hope. If you die in that condition, my friends, it means you're going to die uh, separated from the Lord and to appear before the judgment seat of Christ unprepared, only receive a verdict that's not a favorable verdict. That's what it means to be lost. Now here's a question also to consider. What are the reasons for people being lost? Well, Luke chapter 15, Jesus told us uh, three stories. One concerning the lost sheep, one concerning the lost coin, and one concerning the lost son. Let's think about the lost sheep. The man had a hundred sheep. One of them strayed. The shepherd went out to find that sheep, and he brought it back when he found it, rejoicing. One out of a hundred. Now, why was the sheep lost? Well, the sheep was not lost because the shepherd shooed it away and ran it off. That's not the reason why the sheep was lost. The sheep was not lost because the other sheep nudged it out of the fold and told it to get out of the fold and get gone. That's not the reason why the sheep was lost. The sheep was lost because it just wandered away. Now, I've been told that sheep can be somewhat ignorant, if we use that word to apply to an animal, ignorant. In other words, here's the case of where someone, because of their own ignorance about matters, wanders away from the path that's a good and right way to walk in. There are a lot of folks, my friends, in the world today who are lost and do not realize they're lost. Maybe they're morally good people, but still they're sinners. Don't realize the sad condition they're in. They just wandered away, wandered in the wrong direction. But they're still in danger, my friends, because the wrath of God comes upon the children of disobedience. 
And Jesus said, he that believes not on me is condemned already. And so therefore, there's the condition of one who's wandered away, even though they may be honest and sincere and morally good, they're still sinners, and they're apart from the Lord, like that lost sheep was. And then there's that lost coin. Now, how'd that coin become lost? Well, the woman of the house lost the coin. She had ten coins, and now we find that one of them's lost. Why was it lost? Could it be lost because she misplaced it? Could it be lost because she fumbled it in some way and dropped it and not, didn't realize what had happened? Was it lost because of her own carelessness? But we do know this, that whatever happened when that coin was dropped, gravity took it out of sight. Now, a lot of folks, my friends, are lost today because of the pull of the world, the old gravity pull of the world, leading them away from the truth of righteousness. Now, even though that coin was lost, it had not lost its value. Let me illustrate it like this. Suppose I have a $20 bill, and I accidentally dropped that $20 bill, and I don't know I've dropped it. Yeah, I just dropped it. And somebody then finds that $20 bill. How much is that $20 bill worth? Now, you say, well, the man lost it. It can be worth anything. No, it's still worth $20. We realize that even though a soul may be lost, it's still valuable. Jesus said, Was a man profited to gain the whole world, lose his own soul? And what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Because souls are lost does not mean they've lost their value in God's sight. They're still worth more than all the world. And so sometimes we find the folks get lost because of the pull of the world, or gravity takes them down, but they still have great value in the sight of God. And then we have the case of the lost boy. I should say boys. Because we find in the story of the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15 that the man had two sons, the older son and the younger son. The younger son said to the father, Give me the portion of the inheritance that comes to me. And the father did so. Not many days after that, the younger son got all his plane together and took his journey to a far country. And there we're told he wasted his substance in riotous living. Well, why was that young man lost? He was lost because of his own willfulness, his own willfulness. Well, he came to himself and came back home. And when he came back home, his uh, father received him gladly. His father was looking for him, wanting him to come back home. And as he's on the way back home, his father saw him a great way off coming, ran to meet him. Oh, my friend, that illustrates to us the love of God for lost souls. Now, the older brother, when he came to the house and later heard the music and the dancing, the celebration because his little brother had come home, he became quite pouty about the matter. And the reason being was because he was a self-righteous individual. Interesting, my friends, when the story closes, the prodigal son's inside the father's house, but the elder brother, the older brother's outside the house. That teaches us something, that some folks are lost like the prodigal son through their own willfulness, their own rebellion. And there are others who are lost like the elder brother because of their self-righteousness. And so we have to be careful of our attitude. The wise man Solomon said in Proverbs chapter 30, verse 12, There is a generation that is pure in their own eyes, and yet is not washed from their filthiness. The wise man also said in Proverbs 20, verse 6, most men will proclaim their own goodness. And that's exactly what the elder brother did. He proclaimed his own goodness. He was pure in his own eyes. And yet he himself was a sinner just like his little brother was. When folks reject the divine plan of salvation and seek to save themselves by their own plan, they do so because they're self-righteous people. And self-righteousness, my friend, has caused many a folk to reject the Lord's will. And so we find there's the reason why the people are lost. Now, what reminders can we give to people that are lost? If I'm speaking to someone today who is lost, what should I remind you of? What can I tell you? Well, I'll simply affirm this. You're not so bad that you cannot be saved. Nobody's such a great sinner the Lord cannot forgive their sins. You're not beyond the power and the grace of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared unto all men, 
teaching us the denying ungodliness and worldly lust. We should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world. So don't think yourself such a great sinner. The Lord can't handle your case. Dr. Jesus, the great physician, my friends, can take care of your situation. And sometimes we find the most unlikely souls can be attracted to Christ. The most despised man in the city of Jericho was one that uh, when Jesus left Jericho was in a right condition with the Lord. Let's not look down our noses on other people because they're such great sinners and think that person is such a great sinner. I should not even waste my time even trying to share the gospel with them. The gospel is for everybody. Let's don't go through this life discriminating. We'll preach the gospel to this person and ignore this person. Oh, I know there are some churches who'd like to have all the people that have money come to their church and make a contribution. They're busy counting the money. They're not looking at the souls. I hear some of these uh, motivational preachers. You could write the gospel they preach on the end of your thumb. They're not telling people the truth about what they need to do about their soul salvation. My friends, but nobody's such a great sinner that cannot be saved. And furthermore, even the most unlikely soul in this city is a subject for the salvation of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But to be converted, there must be some changes take place in a person's life. Know ye not that to whom ye you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom you obey, Paul wrote, whether of sin and death or obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine delivered you, Paul said. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. And so in conversion, there must be a change to take place. And now remember this. Christ is always ready to receive those who want him. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, it says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and sup with him and he with me. In the great painting of Jesus standing at the door knocking, one might notice something about that door, and that is there's no knob on the outside of the door. The knob is on the inside. Jesus is not going to force his way into your heart and life, my friends. You must open the door of your heart and let him in. And so Jesus says, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, from meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. What does a lost person then need to do? Well, the Lord's not going to speak to you audibly like he spoke to Zacchaeus when he said to Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus, come down, I'm going to your house today. He's not going to talk to you audibly. But he's speaking to you through his word, the gospel message. He gave his disciples a plan to preach. He said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. And on Pentecost Day, when the gospel was preached for the very first time under that commission, they raised the question, men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter, being true to the commission he received from Jesus, said this, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. And that's exactly what they did. Those that glad to receive the word were baptized. And they were adding to them that day about 3,000 souls. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ, my friends, has not given me permission to offer clemency to anybody. But I can promise you salvation on some other terms other than what the gospel message has to say. We must stay with the gospel message. The terms of forgiveness are set forth upon the pages of God's word. And we'd encourage you to hear the gospel, believe it, and to obey it. Sometimes Jesus passes by for the last time. That was the last time that Jesus passed through the city of Jericho. And one day, my friends, he'll pass by us for the last time. We appreciate the fact you've been watching the program today. We hope it's been sunshine for your soul. We invite you to the service of the Church of Christ here in Sylacauga. Every Sunday morning, 945, we have Sunday school, classes for all ages, 1045, the time for morning worship hour, and again on Sunday evening at 6 o'clock at p.m. for an evening worship service. We meet on Sunday, Wednesday evening at 7 o'clock for a midweek Bible study period. Our meeting place is very easy to find. We're located on the corner of Broadway and Walnut here in the beautiful city of Sylacauga, Alabama. We do hope you accept our invitation. Come out and visit with us. Again, we thank you. We bid you now a very pleasant. Good day.